I see lots of people connecting. So I'm just gonna give it a second to make sure everybody's computer catches up to us. Good morning, everyone. How are y'all doing? Very this well. Is nuts. I'm doing well. I am doing all right. Not bad for a Saturday morning, I have to say. I've got my big old cup of coffee. I've got a second one in the next room just in case I need it, right? Let's be realistic. It is Saturday morning. There's at least two cups in my future. Well, I'm, my name is, I'm going to, there's still a couple of people coming in. So I just want to hold just a second to let everybody come in. Make sure they're all here. One quick announcement. It looks like most people have their name up on their um, Zoom screen. If you don't have your name on there, if you could put your name on there, it just helps us because in the future, well, for example, if you do apply or if you have applied, we will look at um, people who have attended um, open house events or diversity events or what have you that we held so that we can see that you've um, been engaged with us before. So um, if you don't have your name on there, if you could update your Zoom name so that we can uh, see who you are, that would be really helpful. Unless you don't want to know who you are and be all incognito, well, then that's your choice. I'm going to stop my video for just a minute because I happen to have three small furry children in my house that also like devices. Um, and sometimes that makes my internet unstable. So let me just make sure that that will make it a little bit smoother for you to be able to hear me. I'm going to jump right in this morning with a little bit of a presentation. Um, so that you can hear a little bit about our program and then open it up for some questions at the end in case there's anything that I don't cover. So let me just move my screens around very quickly so that y'all can see it cleanly. All right. Bear with me one second. I'm just moving my screen so that I can see all of you at the same time as our slides. So Tyler, you happen to be in a hot spot on my screen. Can you see a bluish looking screen that says preparing visionary nurse leaders? Yes, I can. All right, awesome. Thank you for the assist. I appreciate that. So um, as we go through this slide deck, you will see that um, these are primarily our students and our faculty throughout the slide deck. So they're not stock images, they're our people. They're the people that we routinely spend time with. They are the people that we teach and do all of our stuff with. Um, so you can sort of get a feel for who we are. And this is actually, her name is Crystal and she is a third year nursing anesthesia student preparing to graduate here in August. So we're really excited for her. She is phenomenal. Um, and you can see that that's her at one of our clinical sites actually getting ready for her day. So our core faculty that you will get to know and love are myself, which the love part plus minus, uh, Emily Apero, who you see here with us today, and Dr. Erica Moore. And she was actually on call all night last night, which is why she is not here with us, so that uh, we do let her sleep once in a while. Um, but we're still practicing providers. So that way you know, uh, we walk the walk and talk the talk. Emily's role within our program is pretty unique and it's worth calling out because it's one of the things that sets us apart. In our program, we have 20, I think 24 clinical sites. Actually, we just got one out one, so 25 clinical sites. Um, within our sites, if it's a distance site and how we define distance is considering Atlanta traffic. If you're not from Atlanta, Atlanta has just a wee touch of traffic and it's a little hard to get around for long distances. So if a clinical site is more than 60 miles from our campus, 1520 Clifton Road, we have housing for that site. Um, it may be AHEC housing, it may be a hotel, or we have apartments in um, some locations as well. And Emily coordinates all of the housing for you for your distance rotations, right? The other advantage to that is that we don't come to you and say, you know, Gabriella, you're going on a rotation that's far away. Can you please give us an extra $500 this month, right? It's all built into your tuition and whatnot. But Emily coordinates all of that housing. And in addition, 
one of the things you have to think about when you go to different rotations or different clinical sites is that you have to fill out a whole lot of paperwork before you go. Remember getting credentialed to go work as an RN? I see you, right? You had to like tell them your, your third dog's name, every address you've ever been for every hospital site that you go to. And so Emily actually takes care of all of that. Emily has a, an incredible dossier for every single person. She knows exactly what every single clinical site wants. And before you go, she sends in a packet that has all of your information for them. And every site is a little bit different. Some sites want a background check within 12 months. Some want it within nine weeks. Some of them want two PPDs. Some of them want one. So it really depends on the site as to uh, what they want. And Emily keeps track of all of that and helps facilitate all of that for you. And the reason she does those things is to make sure that your time is spent studying, not doing paperwork, right? So Emily handles all of that. And that is one of the things that helps make our program uh, fairly unique. Some of our other faculty members, Dr. Leslie Jeter, she is responsible for really working closely with our students on their DMP projects, on their scholarly projects. And she actually shepherds our students through those project courses. It's a really great advantage because uh, Dr. Jeter completed her post-master's DNP at Emory. So she has, and this was a number of years ago that she did it, but she's done the scholarly project at Emory. She knows firsthand how to be very successful in doing it. She also knows how to help guide somebody through that process. And it's a huge advantage to have somebody who knows how to do it, has done it. Oh, and by the way, she's a CRNA. So she knows exactly what it is that you're looking at. So um, that's Dr. Jeter. Uh, Dr. Katie Cole, she, is, she uh, is a, works at one of our clinical partner sites as well as with us. And her first love, and I'm so thankful that she has it, is pediatrics. Little people are not my jam. I don't spend a lot of time taking care of little people. In fact, I try to avoid them, except my own. Um, I don't, don't call Child Protective Services. I do love my children. But she is great at pediatrics. And she's one of the go-to people in her practice for pediatric anesthesia. And that's great because I can't teach you that expertise. I would be reading the book and, and regurgitating the book to you. But Dr. Cole can really give you the lived experience. Now, she takes care of plenty of adults as well. But she is a, a phenomenal pediatric clinician as well. And then Dr. James McLeod, he was actually a chief CRNA here at one of our Atlanta hospitals prior to us being able to woo him away to our team. Um, and he has uh, had a robust uh, cardiac practice for a number of years, and he still maintains a cardiac presence, but then also has moved into doing some very large, very um, cutting edge anesthesia for um, oncology practices. So a huge range from our faculty as far as their expertise. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but Dr. Moore does everything, but her two sort of primary foci are um, trauma. She's a trauma guru. I mean, she did trauma call over the weekends at Grady for a very long time. And if that doesn't tell you that she can do trauma, nothing will. And then she's also excellent at um, OB. So she, uh, those are sort of her two specialty areas as well. These are our first two cohorts. So the class of 2020, um, you'll see them here in the class of 2021. These were smaller cohorts. These were only cohorts the size of 10. When we first opened the program in 2017, we wanted to, to stay small and nimble, just because when you start something new, you know that there's gonna be hiccups in the road. You just don't know what they're gonna be yet or you would have fixed them already. So we stayed small the first couple of years just to make sure that we were nimble and that we could address anything that we needed to address. We had great success. And so then we moved to a cohort of 15 students. So this is the class of 2022. So they're currently in their second year. They're going through their specialties. They're in OB and cardiac and peripheral nerve blocks. Um, so and they're still mostly smiling this big, although not always. And then this is our current first year cohort. And this is a quote from one of the, uh, their classmates who I have used this with his permission, but Everett wrote that they are the Corona cohort. I'd say that we most definitely started one of the most rigorous programs during some of the most interesting times. It couldn't have been a better, I couldn't have picked a better group of individuals to experience it with. Here's to the vid crew on our journey to becoming official members of the gas gang. And I really like this because it shows that this group of intrepid individuals 
stepped into anesthesia school, which is no small feat in the middle of the global pandemic. So, you know, choose your poisons in life. If they can do this, they can do anything. But they are already in clinical. They finished their second semester in May. They have already been in clinical now for two months because we're an integrated program. When you're looking at programs, you want to think about how do you learn and what fits you? So some people can do a front-loaded program, no problem. And what I mean by front-loaded is you have all of your didactic coursework up front. So you take all of the classroom stuff in the first year, year and a half. Once you pass through all of that, then you go to clinical. And so a year and a half in, then you go to your first clinical rotations, and then you're in clinical basically until you graduate. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I am not the smartest bulb in the chandelier. So I, I probably would not be wildly successful in a program like that. I need to read about it, have somebody help me teach about it so I can get the finer points that I, I wasn't getting from reading it. I need to go to the simulation lab. I need to put my hands on something that I can't hurt too badly or that you can at least bring back to life. And then I need to go do it on real people, right? So I learn better that way. And that's how this program is set up. It's an integrated program. So your first two semesters are totally didactic. In your second semester, you will spend a lot of time in simulation and it's simulations to get you ready to go to the OR. You will go through the induction sequence and intubation dozens and dozens, and did I say dozens of times. You will learn how to place spinals and epidurals on mannequins. I just showed you this uh, cohort up here. And if you look back here, this gentleman, this gentleman, those two for sure have already placed spinal anesthetics themselves. This person and his second week did three peripheral nerve blocks. They've all done intubations, right? So they're at the end of the second semester of study and they're already doing all of those things. So that second semester simulation is intense. And it's that way to get you ready to go to the OR and day one, you're doing things. You don't follow a nurse around for three months and then maybe get to intubate. You're intubating day one. So we'll get to there and we'll get you ready. But, and then from that day forward, you're in class, clinical and simulation every semester. You start two days of clinical. And then by the end of the program, you're in four days a week of clinical and one day of class. Everybody always wants to know what our, our pool looks like, what makes you competitive or not. I would like you to look at this with two lenses. These are averages. And if you've spent any time in statistics, you know that an average is just that, and it's an average. We have people who have 4.0s and we have people who do not have, what was last year, a 3.61 GPA, right? We have people, our, probably our most successful recent graduate came in with a 3.2 but was a phenomenal learner. And when we interviewed was, the first impression I had from this individual was, it does not matter what I throw at them. They will sit at their kitchen table and study it until they get it. Now they may have had a 3.2 GPA, but I could tell that from them just that easily during their interview. And they led me, they were, I was absolutely right. They were amazing, phenomenal learner, did great clinically, graduated, flew through boards, and is now practicing as a CRNA. So if you don't have a 3.61, please don't leave the Zoom at this moment and be like, well, that's it for me. It's okay, but this is averages, all right? So what you tend to see is GPAs around a 3.6, 3.7, science GPAs around a 3.5, 3.6. And we do pull out your science courses from your transcript and we calculate out a science GPA. It has a very high correlation with success in anesthesia school because we are a very science-driven profession. So if you don't have a strong science score or a science background, or if you are like, I just want to bone up a little bit on some sciences before I start school, just to make sure that I'm like ready to roll. Um, a lot of people say, I'm going to retake chemistry. If you did really poorly in chemistry, okay. But if you are looking to get a leg up as you start a program, I would say go back to your anatomy and physiology or go back to pharmacology. Those are the two things for our program that are gonna give you that leg up. Physiology, anatomy and physiology. Let's be honest, most of us took anatomy like, I don't know, 18, 19 years old or when we might have had other things that were enticing to participate in during our uh, bachelor's work that maybe pulled us from the anatomy lab on weekends. Um, so if you haven't thought about that in a minute, that may be something you wanna consider. 
Um, you'll see that for 2021, we have under GRE, we have NA. If you do some reading, you'll see that GRE scores don't tend to be indicative of success in graduate school. Um, that was something that was required by our admissions group. And then as we followed our metrics and we looked at how people were doing from a GPA perspective in our program, how they were doing on the pre-board exam, and then how they ultimately did on boards, there was near zero correlation with the GRE, right? So your ability, surprisingly enough, to do high school geometry will not demonstrate your success in our anesthesia program. So we got rid of the requirement. All right, if it's not gonna help us say that you're gonna be great and amazing in anesthesia, there's really no point in having you do it other than to jump through some sort of fiery hoop and we're not really into all of that craziness. So no GRE is required. Average age, um, late 20s, although we definitely have older and younger. Um, our male to female ratio in the incoming uh, cohort is 10 to five. About 40% of our candidates have come from out of state. And you can see um, the number of applications that we've gotten over time. Um, if you look in the first year where you see XX applications, um, at that point we were doing rolling admissions. So it's a little bit harder to pin down the number because we rolled through them and it was either put them in an interview pile or um, the number I was gonna put up there um, given that I wasn't always here for those. So that's why it's an XX. I didn't want to give you incorrect information. So what does our curriculum look like? So your foundations courses, they're the three P's. Everybody has to do them. Um, advanced physical assessment, advanced pharmacology, and advanced pathophysiology. You will take these courses most times with other APRN specialty students. So a nurse practitioner uh, or midwifery students. And then we'll take each of those. Those are essentially survey courses, 30,000 foot broad survey courses. We will then dig into each of those substantially further. So then if you look at the science category, first semester you have chemistry and physics. A lot of that are the principles that you're gonna need for your pharmacology class, as well as for things like, how does the anesthesia gas machine work? How does air flow through the lungs for physiology? Those types of things. Your pharmacology for anesthesia, you're going to know more about propofol than you ever thought possible, right? We're going to dig real hard into those medications that are going to have some sort of impact for you in your anesthesia practice. And then advanced uh, pathophysiology, that's actually a two series course. So it's over your first summer and your second fall. Your first summer, we do cardiac, um, vascular, and neuro. And then in the uh, fall semester, we do all of the other subjects but we dig hard. So you will literally spend uh, three weeks on nothing but respiratory physiology, and you will know why you take every breath you take down to the cellular level. Um, it's pretty intense, but it's a lot of fun. And there are times when you walk away from that course, honestly thinking, huh, I did that for a really long time. And that's the reason why we did that. That's pretty cool, right? Do you know why you need to drink more water in the winter when you're outside? because of that cold weather and um, thinking about uh, atmospheric pressures and evaporation within your lungs because of the change in temperature, right? All those things are really cool, um, but you'll go through all of that. And then under anesthesia, basic and advanced principles. Basic principles is in that second semester. That is what I lovingly call anesthesia 101. You're going to the OR at the end of the semester and you're gonna be amazing. So, you live, that's where you learn to do the spinals and the epidurals and the induction sequence and emergence. And what is in that case? And how do I do all this regional stuff? And um, so it's a pretty intense course. It's five and a half hours every Monday morning. And we dig into, I'm gonna get ready to go to the OR. Now that's the didactic portion, five and a half hours on the, in the morning on Monday. And then you're in SIM on Tuesdays. And you'll spend over a hundred hours in SIM in that semester alone, getting ready to go to the operating room. And then from there, you move into advanced principles, right? We're gonna talk about thoracic anesthesia and double lumen tubes and placing bronchial blockers and how do I run my bronchoscopy and doing all of those skills. We're gonna move into peripheral nerve blocks and you're gonna do peripheral nerve blocks. Then we escalate, we do PEDS, OB, neuro, cardiac, so on and so forth, trauma, burns, all the way across the gamut until the day that you graduate, you're covering specialties. Your transformation courses, 
those are what people think of typically as DMP courses. So you've got um, your uh, quality improvement, your systems thinking uh, classes, health policy, equity, and law, um, your professional practice, your scholarly um, project courses as well, which we had talked about. Dr. Jeter will help shepherd you through along with your um, other CRNA faculty. Your clinical practicum we talked about, you start at the end of second semester, two days a week, and you traverse the entire curriculum until you're at four days a week. And then, like I said, those project courses. So if you were to start with us, this is what your life would look like. So your first semester, you have five classes. It is not for the faint of heart. However, once accepted, if you wanna take a course or two ahead of time, you can certainly do that. So both advanced farm and advanced patho, we could help you enroll in in advance. So if you wanted to you know, take it um, while you're still working full-time before you actually started in the fall of 2022, so you only had four courses, we can certainly do that. But you've got advanced farm, advanced patho, those survey courses, and chem and physics with us. And then the um, courses that have the D on it are actually DMP courses. So this is your systems course um, and your analytics course right here in this first semester. Notice in the second semester, it's a different color, it's green. And the reason it's a different, that is because we are having you go all in on anesthesia in this semester so that you can really focus on your anesthesia skill set in order to be ready to go into the operating room. And I'm gonna pause for a quick sip of coffee. I told you that was going to happen. So in that second semester, we really want you to focus on being ready to go to the operating room. So you're gonna be over hundred hours in simulation. And I don't know if you did simulation in your bachelor's work, but a lot of times in those sims, it was seven or eight of you as students and one or two faculty it's sort of, we flip the switch on that quite a bit in our anesthesia sims. It's usually one of, one of you, sometimes two, um, and three to four faculty members. So you're getting a lot of laser attention and it can be really hard and intimidating because there you are going through an induction sequence and you know you've got four faculty watching you and giving you feedback. But it's, we're all sort of looking for different things. We all see different things. We all can show you different ways to tweak what you're doing to help it fit you, right? So if you're particularly tall, have big hands and whatever, how you hold that spinal needle is gonna be tweaked a little bit from somebody who's got these cute little dainty hands and you know the world is their oyster because no back is too small for them to manipulate. So we can work with you in SIM to really help you refine your individual personal technique. Um, then third semester, you're in class clinical and simulation. And then beginning in the fourth semester, you see it changes color again and it's purple. That's because those are where you start the DMP project courses. And I wanted to draw attention to the fact that they're a different color because you'll note that you finish your project courses a full two semesters before the curriculum ends. That's critical to note because what happens if something goes wrong with your DMP project? And I mean, goes wrong, maybe it's completely out of your control, but you're supposed to be collecting data and there's a global pandemic and you can't get into the operating room for a month. Well, now you're behind. And if those projects went right up to the end of the curriculum, you wouldn't graduate on time, right? If you don't graduate, you can't sit for boards, you can't sit for boards, you can't be a CRNA. So we have allowed for buffer of that last two semesters so that if anything happens with your project and you need to extend it a semester, it's not a big deal. And you actually, we've done it on this chart. So right here, this 721D, that's if your project isn't done. So let's just imagine in a perfect world, which I'm just gonna knock on some wood, all of our students have finished their projects on time in the last purple column. So we're just gonna to try to keep that trend going. We've been very fortunate and working really hard so far. But if you took 721D off under the spring 2005 semester, look, you only have two courses. You've got your anesthesia course and your last DMP course, which is your pathways to practice. It's a business course. Then your last semester, Again, if you've already finished your project, you don't have 721. It's all anesthesia all the time. And that's intentional because that last semester, we want you to finish any last cases, hours, or specialties you need. And we want you digging in for boards because by the time you graduate, our goal is that everybody takes boards and passes on their first attempt within 30 days of graduation, right? 
a lot of people say, well, you know, should I buy Apex? Should I buy Prodigy? Do I need to do Valley? If you choose to do those things, that is your choice. If you come to Emory, our goal is to prepare you for boards, not tell you to go buy a commercially available product to prepare you for boards. That's what we're for. Now, some students like extra study questions, and so they'll get those types of products for extra exam questions type thing, but we do not mandate that you buy something like that, nor do we require it or teach from it. Like I said, we have 25 clinical partners. Most of them are in Georgia. Um, we have one in Tennessee and two in Alabama. I have to think about my math really hard and I shouldn't this early in the morning. Um, so we have everything from academic medical centers to community hospitals to rural hospitals. We have anesthesia care team models. We have CRNA only practices. We've got urban, we've got rural, we've got inpatient, we've got outpatient. We want you to see everything. And the reason for that is again, when you're looking on a job search and you may come from a giant academic medical center and you will like give me the absolute minimum number of PEDS cases I have to do and that is all I want. And I've done that with students before and they go to their children's rotation and they're like, oh, I wanna go work at a pediatric hospital when I graduate. They didn't even think they like kids and here they wanna go work at a children's hospital. You don't know in anesthesia what you want until you get into it. You found your passion as an ICU nurse, but your passion as an ICU nurse may be different than your passion as a CRNA. So we want you to experience everything so that when you're going on a job search, you know exactly what it is that you want to do, right? If you stay local, it gives you a really good um, sort of taste of where you might wanna work or where you may not wanna work, right? Like, you know, they're all lovely there, but, uh, uh that's just, that's not the site for me. Or, you know what, I was at this clinical site and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna bring them donuts on my last day because I want them to hire me when I'm done. I loved it so much, I wanna come back, right? So it gives you a nice taste. When you are looking at programs, another thing to think about is um, the cases and how you get those cases. And there's lots of different ways that programs do that. And none of them are right or wrong or better or different but you need to work with what fits your personality and your learning style. So some programs have two or three primary hospitals. You're assigned to one of those sites and you do basically all of your cases at that one facility, unless they don't do something. Like let's say you go to this academic medical center and they just don't do pediatrics. You'll rotate out to go to some place to do pediatrics and then you'll come back to that one main hospital. And that's fine, that's one model. The challenge, in my opinion, with that is you learn one way of doing things, which as a student is great because by two months in, you know what everybody likes and what everybody doesn't like, and you can meet what they want. But that's not always what the, is best for the patient or what the patient needs. So within ours, you're going to rotate through more than a dozen facilities during your time with us. And like I said, you're going to see it all, urban, rural, anesthesia care team, CRNA only practice, you will all rate, rotate through CRNA only practice, right? I need you to see what that looks like. I need you to see what a care team looks like. So one thing to consider. The other thing to consider is that nationally, the two types of cases that are hardest for most programs to get are open cardiac cases and peripheral nerve blocks. The reason for open cardiac cases is that we're doing so much more interventionally now, right? I mean, they're doing a lot of things in the cath lab that with interventional cardiology that was never even considered, you know, even 10 years ago. So we don't open as many chests as we used to. And there's a lot of competition to get those cases, right? There's CRNA students, there's uh, anesthesia residents, heck, there's cardiac fellows, there's all of that. One of the ways that we're able to get around that is that um, we have a really close partnership with Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and they have opened up their cardiac suite to us. So all of our students go on a six to eight week immersion at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, where they do main cardiac OR, EP lab, and cath lab with the cardiac team at Vandy. Now, when you, have, when you graduate, in order to graduate and sit for boards, you have to have done five, count them, five cardiac cases. I've done cardiac anesthesia almost my entire career. And I have to tell you that if I only had five of them under my belt when I started cardiac anesthesia, I would have been the original hot mess express. I would not have been facile with trying to do a cardiac an an uh, anesthetic. That's why we think the six to eight week immersion is so important. Even if 
your goal in life is not to do cardiac anesthesia. I promise you there will be some time in your career where you have a patient who is either a cardiac cripple or you get thrown into a cardiac assignment because you're the strongest practitioner they have and there's no one that does cardiac regularly. Surprise! So you will have the tools to be able to do that, right? You'll have way more. Most of our students have 45 to 50 cardiac cases by the time they're done, not five. Um, in addition, I just told you we had a new clinical site that was approved literally this week and they do cardiac for our students. So if you do like cardiac, you've done your immersion and you wanna have another rotation and cardiac to get ready, we're more than happy to have you rotate through to be able to do another cardiac rotation. I told you the second case that's difficult are peripheral nerve blocks. Um, there are some challenges because some people believe that physicians should uh, place peripheral nerve blocks. However, it is well within a CRNA scope of practice to be able to do that. And again, from a, an accreditation perspective, you have to do 10 peripheral nerve blocks. At least one of those 10 has to be on a real life human. Some can be simulated. We have two high volume outpatient orthopedic sites that, do, that are CRNA only practices where you will rotate to do peripheral nerve blocks. Our students, I just actually looked at this yesterday for a completely different reason, but the class that's graduating, the person who has the fewest has 68, and the person who has the most is just shy of 100 peripheral nerve blocks. And those are all on real life people. None of those are simulated. We, have a, we do a whole bunch with simulation prior to you going on those rotations to feel good about your peripheral nerve block and ultrasound skills, but those are not counted in that. So between 68 and 95 peripheral nerve blocks um, per person for the class that's graduating, not 10 with at least one being on a real life human. So you feel pretty confident that when you walk away, you're gonna be great at ultrasonography and you're gonna be ready to do peripheral nerve blocks. Another exciting thing that is happening um, is that Emory is, um, if you're from Atlanta, this, is, this building is in Decatur, it was the old Wells Fargo building. Um, Emory is, the School of Nursing is renovating 70,000 square feet in this building. And the entire terrace level is devoted to simulation. And um, we should be moving in late spring, early summer of 2022 um, for all of our simulations in this building. So this is the floor plan that we're looking at. If you look right here, Hi-Fi OR right here, this is us, there's our little control room. Um, so this is our dedicated operating room where we can do all of our simulations. In addition, you'll see at the top here, can you see my pointer? Ashley, you're in the hot seat now. Can you see my pointer? Um, I cannot see your pointer, I'm sorry. Okay, then let me give you clocks. So 12 o'clock, you're gonna see gray mechanical rooms. If you look immediately to the left of that, you see red-ish, I'm gonna call that red. I know it's not really red, but red. And on the far left of that, it's hi-fi and then parentheticals OR. That's our control, that's our operating room and the control room is right next to it. And then if you continue to reverse right, you see high five, four, three, and two. Those are other high fidelity rooms that we can use for things like an ICU or a patient room. So let's say that we wanna simulate a patient um, collapsing in their room on the floor and they call anesthesia stat or um, a rapid response. We can pull you from the operating room to run into those other rooms to figure out how to intubate a patient laying on the floor in a code type situation, right? So real life experience. Um, we have plenty of briefing and debriefing rooms. So if you look at OR5 and you traverse down the page past the stairwell, you see those briefing. So they're either pre-brief or post debriefing rooms. And at the very far left, if you look, there's a multi-use skills room. So that has lots of desks. So we have um, torsos, for example, that you originally will learn like spinals and epidurals on. So we can spread you out across those tables, three or four of you at a time, have three or four faculty where we're one-on-one -on -one with you and we're going and, and literally helping you with spinals and epidural placement. On the far left of that, you see there's actually four bays there. We can run that as a pre-op suite where you're pre-oping patients. We can run it as a PACU where you are the anesthesia provider who's providing PACU care. And we have four standardized patients in there who all have different things going on. Because if you're practicing independently, you may have to manage the PACU, right? That would fall on your shoulders. And so you need to decide, okay, this person's ready to discharge. This is what we need to do for pain for this person. We're gonna pop in a peripheral nerve block on this patient because they had a thoracotomy and they're in incredible pain. So we're gonna go ahead and give them a peripheral nerve block so that they can lighten their pain a little bit. And this one has intractable nausea vomiting. And by the way, you've got nurses to help you. You've got two nurses to help you, but you're running the show there. 
We can turn it into an infusion clinic and talk about what if it's a ketamine infusion practice, right? We've got a lot of our CRNA colleagues who are doing that these days. So we can manipulate this space quite a bit to be able to make things um, what we need them to be for various simulations. And then, I'm so sorry, my daughter has brought me a little present. Thank you so much, sweetheart. Could you put it downstairs for me? Yesterday was my birthday. I'm 27, if anybody asks. And I haven't managed to open up all of the presents and we are very excited to open them. Um, and then if you look down in the bottom right-hand corner, you see sort of a purpley blue. These are all exam rooms and they're built like clinic exam rooms. And again, the reason for that is when we do advanced physical assessment, you need to be able to do a head to toe physical assessment. And people always push back. They're like, I don't wanna be a nurse practitioner. I wanna be a CRNA and I'm not gonna be seeing it. Let me tell you, you are gonna see patients like that because in pre-anesthesia testing centers, that's a lot of times CRNAs who are there and you need to go ahead and be able to pre op that patient from head to toe and pick up anything that's been missed. And I will tell you, there are a lot of places where patients their primary care is coming at their pre-surgical visit. And that's your job to realize that, huh, they have a heart murmur that we've never picked up before. Look at that. I ran their EKG and they have a fascicle block and they've never been seen by cardiology before. You have to be able to pick those things up. So we have that environment set up. And then up here in the top right-hand corner, you'll see yellow. Those are skills labs. So we've built in skills labs throughout the space where we can set up independent practice time for you. So you're in your second semester, you're learning to intubate, you're learning to go through the induction sequence, and you're like, I am all thumbs intubating. We can bring out the airway mannequins and all the equipment, the LMAs, the bougies, what have you, and have them in that space. So you can come in and just practice your skills whenever you want to, all right? So like I said, this space, super exciting. It's being constructed as we speak. Um, and so this will be available beginning late spring, early summer. And I, I give you those dates. They've given us a date, but it's construction. Let's just be realistic about it. I'm going to say late spring, early summer, because we've already had one delay. We were supposed to be in there in March. So I'm just going to hedge my bets. And they say May, but I'm going to just hedge in case there's any other excitement that's found. So in order to apply, oh, and this is what I'm talking about with those um, task trainers to learn to place spinals and epidurals. So if you look, there's one back here. Uh, uh, okay, so if you look at Brittany, Brittany has sort of a blue and black flowered hat here in the front right. You can't really see her whole back, but you can sort of see the shiny flesh colored kind of thing up here in the top right. That's one back. You'll see Sam over here. He's got a different color and different looking back. And then you'll see Jordan here and he's got a completely different one. That's intentional. No two backs feel the same. And no two backs are the same to put a, a spinal and epidural in. So we make the students use all different kinds of backs so they get used to not always feeling like they've got the same. Um, but this is where you see Dr. Moore here. So this is our assistant program director, Dr. Moore. She's fantastic. I kind of think she's the bee's knees, but don't tell her I said that. I, I don't want her to get an email. Um, and what you can't see is uh, me and another faculty member off screen here. But there's three students, three faculty, and we're, we're following them one-on-one -on -one, and then we sort of rotate so that we can help them out. But to qualify for application, you have to have a baccalaureate degree from an accredited program, minimum GPA of 3.0. We do not round. So if you have a 2.97, you do not have a 3.0 GPA. And that is an odd, that's pretty much the only automatic dismissal from consideration that we have. And we will look at your GPA first. If it's not a 3.0, we will not consider it. Now, if you have a 2.97 and you go back and you take some graduate level science courses and boost that GPA above a three, then we will look at your application, okay? Um, but we're very clear, we don't round up for that. You have to have an RN license um, and you have to be able to uh, get a Georgia license. You can't, I'm not even sure how, what you would do to have the State Board of Nursing tell you you're not eligible to have a license in Georgia, but if that's happened to you, A, let me know what that is so that I can use that as an example, but two, you have to be able to be, have an RN license in Georgia. You need three letters of recommendation, and we're very specific. You must have one from your supervisor, your nurse manager, or whomever that person is on your ICU who gives you your annual review. It can't just be the charge nurse unless your charge nurse does your annual review. It needs to be, it may be an assistant manager, it may be a manager, depending on how big your unit is, 
or what their dynamics are, but whoever gives you your annual review is the person who needs to fill that out. We need one from your um, baccalaureate work, from your academic work. This is not, let me repeat this, this is not your nurse educator. This is not the clinical nurse specialist on your floor. We need somebody who's seen you or worked with you in the academic setting and can speak to that there. It can be um, a faculty advisor from your uh, baccalaureate work. It can be a professor that you got along well with and did well in their course. It can be an assistant or associate dean that you were friendly with when you were in school, any of those things, but they need to be able to speak to your time as a student. And then the third one is your choice. And we would strongly encourage it be somebody that can tell us why you're going to be a great candidate. Now, sometimes we get letters from let's say family friends. Now, it's one thing if somebody says, and Elaine, I'm really sorry, I'm gonna put you on the spot because you're in the wrong spot and you're sneezing, bless you. Elaine may have somebody who is like, I have known Elaine since she is 12 and she drew the most beautiful rainbows when she was in kindergarten, clearly an overachiever. That's one type of letter. We can also get a letter that says, you know what, she has shadowed me in the operating room for three months on her own time to really make sure that she understands the role of nurse anesthesia. She understands what she's getting herself into. This is a profession that she wants to be in. She asks great questions. She comes prepared, right? Those are two different personal type of references. Choose your poison, which one you want to put in. I mean, maybe Elaine, maybe the rainbow really is your jam and that's okay. But that personal, that third letter is really, we want to know something about you. We want to know what's going to make you a great CRNA. We do need your official transcripts from everywhere. If you have gone to 17 schools, maybe taking one class at 16 of them and of the bulk of them at the other one, we need all of them. We do not need your high school transcript. People ask that quite often. We don't need high school. Anything after high school, we need, all right? One year minimum of critical care experience. You can apply before you have that full year, um, but you have to have the year before you would start the program. And it does have to be the equivalent of full-time experience. So if you um, have been working maybe 20 hours a week of critical care and 20 hours a week of emergency department, then it would take you two years to have that experience because emergency department does not count for us as critical care. So one year full-time equivalent critical care experience. BLS, ACLS PALS, um, we are a little bit flexible with this, um, although we try not to be too flexible um, because people tend to get behind. If you come from a pediatric environment and you have PALS, but not ACLS, we can live with that. If you come from an adult background and have ACLS, but not PALS, we can live with that. However, you must have what you don't have if you're accepted before you start the program. You must have ACLS, BLS, and PALS before the program starts, and you must maintain all of those the entire way through. They cannot lapse, all right? We need your um, resume. Please pass your resume along to others to take a peek at. Um, you're gonna want them to look at not only what it says, but how it looks, right? So we're looking at your attention to detail. How is that formatting? Is it kind of all over the place? Is it a hot mess? Or does it look like you took the time and had the attention to detail to make it legible, readable, articulate, um, you know, let us know it's comprehensive. So when you're looking at your resume, it's not just a communication of information, which we certainly look for, but we're also looking for your attention to detail within how that is presented. A minimum of 16 hours of shadowing we would encourage you to get the most shadowing you can get where you work, where you don't work. If you can go peds, OB, inpatient, outpatient, super sick, super healthy, anesthesia practice, care team practice, anything that you can see and as much as you can see will be to your benefit, all right? So the more you see, the more you can know what to expect when you go into the operating room because I already told you, we're gonna put you through lots and lots and lots of different environments. And then last, a graduate level statistics course. And there's an asterisk next to this. With the pandemic, we've tried to be very understanding that life is very tricky for a lot of people. Um, and for y'all who are ICU nurses, it has been 
a heck of a year. Many of you took care of a lot of COVID patients in the last year. And for that, I just wanna say thank you for taking care of your patients and their families and your communities. Uh, that has not been an easy thing to do. And so kudos to you and thank you to all of you who were doing that in the last year. Um, and we wanted to be very considerate about our incoming cohorts um, and thinking about their time. And many of them were you know, doing 16 hour days, seven days a week. So um, we waived the graduate level statistics course requirement for our class that is about to begin in August of 2021. And we've embedded that into the curriculum um, for their coursework. And we're gonna evaluate how that goes this year to make sure that it, it works well. Um, and then see if that is a that we can get rid of and that incorporated into our coursework. So if you haven't already taken a graduate level statistics, course, don't do it. Um, and we always tell people don't do graduate level statistics course. Other programs don't. And I don't want you to spend the money on that until you know that this is indeed the program that you want to go to. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up that we're always trying to evolve and we're always trying to make things better. Um, and this is one of those things that we're doing. So um, as of right now, it is a requirement, but it ha has some likelihood that we could change that. Our deadlines, June 1st priority deadline and September 1st final deadline. It does not matter if this is a Monday, a Friday, or a Sunday. These are the dates. Um, what does it mean, priority deadline? We take 15 students a year. We do not pre-admit. There were no unbelievable applications from last year that we've rolled forward and they have a seat in the 2022 cohort. We don't roll them forward. So all 15 seats were open as of June 1st. When you put your application in for June 1st, all of those that are complete, we review and we literally review them personally. Um, Emily, Dr. Moore and I review each one of those one by one by one and go through and decide um, interview or not. Then we'll bring those who are um, offered an interview either in or this year we're doing a hybrid, either a Zoom or in-person interview. And then we make our decisions, accept, waitlist, or deny. And we try to have those decisions in place before September 1st. So for the second deadline, September 1st, the final deadline, if you don't have all of the pieces of your application in by September 1st, you will not be considered. Um, if you don't have them in by the June 1st deadline, we just leave your application there for you to be able to finish. Um, and then we will interview in September to fill whatever seats weren't filled by the June 1st deadline. And sometimes we fill 10 of the 15 seats. Sometimes we fill three of the 15 seats. We have not, and again, I'm knocking on wood, filled all 15 seats for the June deadline before, um, but it's possible that that could happen. We would still interview in September, but it would be for the wait list at that point. Every year our applications open um, on or about March 1st. Our admissions team opens those applications. So that isn't us. So if March 1st falls on a Sunday, it probably will happen March 2nd. Um, we don't ask them to work on weekends just because we do. If you have questions, this is our um, CRNA uh, email. So this will go to typically either Emily or myself and we try very hard to stay on top of those. I will tell you just before June 1st and just before September 1st, we tend to get a lot of messages um, and we wade through them as quickly as we can. But please, if you're thinking about putting in an application, if you haven't already, try not to wait till the last possible moment because it's Murphy's Law that you'll have questions in that last moment that you wanna have answered and it, so does everybody else. Um, you're going to uh, meet Katie Kennedy here in the next hour, and she is our financial aid person. So she's going to go through all of the financial aid stuff, but I just wanted to put a little plug in that she um, will be meeting with us at 10 o'clock. And then if you want to sort of see a life in our, uh, a day in the life of our, our students, we do maintain a social media presence. Uh, the class that graduated last year shared with me that because I used Facebook and pretty much not a whole lot else that that makes me old. Um, I liked them prior to that moment, um, but we do have Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter accounts. I will tell you, we're probably most active on Instagram. It seems to be where most young hip folks are. Apparently, I need to up my game a bit, um, but these are, again, some pictures of things that our students are actually doing. So 
far left, you'll see Dr. McLeod um, and Chelsea. She's one of our current first year students. She's learning to tie the surgeon's knot in simulation because you're gonna need that when you put in arterial lines or when you're sewing in your central lines. The next slide you'll see is Sierra. And this is one of our, he actually is uh, one of our site coordinators um, and preceptors. And he's also a guru of peripheral nerve blocks, uh, Eddie Thomas and our student Sierra. Yep, that's a pork butt. Mm -hmm. um, and she's prior to going on her peripheral nerve block rotation, we're very new though. And the, it's actual you know, muscle and tissue, which looks like actual muscle and tissue on a human. And we will put things in the pork butt so that she has to find them and then she'll hold her needle and she'll find them in plane, she'll find them out of plane so that you're doing it in a simulated environment prior to driving that needle on a human. Uh, in the middle, you'll see Kyle. He's actually scanning Brittany, another student. His uh, performance or his um, scholarly project is on point of care ultrasound um, airway screening to anticipate the difficult airway. So he did all of his training on uh, point of care ultrasound for airway assessment and then wanted to practice. And so we set him up in the sim lab and the first years were fantastic. They came around like, hey, can you scan my neck? And so he was ultrasounding everybody's neck to see if anybody had a difficult airway. Um, so great practice for him before he started collecting data on patients. Uh, then you'll see uh, Susie, she's actually getting ready to graduate. She's an absolute rock star. Uh, you can tell her I said that if you see her. This is actually at one of our clinical sites. So we did a workshop with one of our clinical partner sites um, with uh, emergency airway cricothyrotomies and central lines. And Susie happened to be on rotation that day and that was a Saturday morning. So she came and did some central lines with us uh, and some of her preceptors. So it was a nice way to sort of have a collegial environment between um, some students and some of the preceptors. And on the far right, you'll see Noelle Shaw. Um, she graduated, she's actually gonna be probably one of your preceptors um, at one of our clinical sites. And the reason I love this picture of Noelle is this is her in the locker room on her first clinical rotation, immediately before going in to do her first ever anesthetic in the OR at the end of her second semester. And if you look really close into Noelle's eyes, you will see a little bit of fear and trepidation. But more, more than that, you see in her, and a little bit of fear is healthy, right? Like it's her first anesthetic. You're allowed to be a little bit nervous, but what you see is confidence and excitement and poise. And I just, it's the perfect meld of, I can do this, I've got this. I have a healthy respect for this is a little bit scary, but I got this before her very first anesthetic. So I always love that picture of Noel and like to add it in. But you can see all of our handles down below. And then these are, again, there's Susie on the right and on the left is Lana. And this is her learning to intubate. Um, so she's in the skills lab and she wanted some extra time to practice. So there she is. You can see the gas machine behind her. We call it a blue bell, regardless of the color, which throws off our simulation people sometimes because we still call that red thing, the blue bell. Um, but um, there they are in simulation. So what questions can I answer for all of you? What did I not cover that you want to know? Be brave. If you need extra time in the sim lab, how easy is that to obtain? Um, well, once in, once we have the uh, new simulation site up, it's gonna be very easy. Um, and so what we do is a couple of things. It depends on what the skill is that you need, Justin. It could be, let's say it's, it's basic, it's intubation. We have a couple of things. You, you can just make an appointment with us and we'll set you up in the sim lab to be able to do it. Or um, if we have our own suite of rooms in the School of Nursing, we can actually bring those airway heads there and let you work on them um, there as well. Um, so it's not that hard. You just have to communicate with us. Um, if that's something that you wanna be able to do, we can, we can make that happen in one of a couple of different environments. On the flip side, if we feel like you're struggling with intubation um, and need additional time, we may ask you to come in and work one-on-one -on -one with us. Um, on off hours, just to give you that extra time so that you can have that confidence. And I'll tell you, um, every year in the second semester, we have a couple of students who just for whatever reason, that induction sequence, they just need a little, they need a few extra runs. I've always brought them in one-on-one -on -one with me for just about an hour each. And by the end of it, they're some of the strongest ones in the group, but they just need that repetition a few more times than everyone else. And then they fly. Um, so it's not hard to get. 
quite honestly. We just make an appointment and do it. No one else uses our OR, so it makes it really easy. <laughs> we don't have to compete for space. I have a question, Kelly. Yes. So um, I saw for the applications, um, it's needed for eight hour shadow experience. If you have those eight hour shadow experience, how do we communicate that with you? Or do we have to write up like an essay saying what we learned or what we watched, or do we just say that in the interview? Gabriella, great question. And um, it's actually 16 hours, not eight hours. And we are very much not into busy work. I got to say, you're going to have more to do and not enough time as it is. So we don't ask you to have anybody sign any papers or keep a log or write an essay, right? To me, that's just busy work. When you come for an interview, we will talk to you about your shadowing experience, right? We'll dig into that a little bit um, and talk about those experiences. So that helps you to jot down some notes to help you remember it. That's totally fine. Um, but you don't have to turn it into us or anything. Um, and some people, I'll be honest, some people fib and say, oh yeah, I did my shadowing experience. It's wildly obvious when we talk to you during the interview that you didn't do it. Um, so we don't make you have a log or anything like that. We, we would just have a conversation about it. We get to know kind of what you saw, um, things that struck out to you. We'll ask you some questions, but yeah, that's just make sure that you do it. Take it all in, just take it all in. Okay. I have a Thank you so much. Sure. I have a question. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Abdul. So um, I understand the GPA part. Um, Besides mm -hmm. GPA being um, you have to be still out of your science GPA, what would you say that you are looking for in um, the applicants, uh, personality wise, beyond that? You know, because, you know, people are different beyond just academia. So is there anything that attracts applicants to Emory um, that attract um, Emory to the applicants that makes them select um, individuals to, this, um, to the program? Great question, yes. So I will be wildly honest and tell you that your paper application is what gets you to interview. What gets you in the program is your interview. So we're looking for a couple of things. One, we're looking to seat a team. Your cohort will be your team. And so we're looking for people who are team players who wanna work together. It's really hard to give anesthesia and isolation. There are other people involved. There are nurses, there are surgeons, there's potentially other physicians involved, right? So you've gotta be able to be a team member. And in your cohort, you may not always like each other, but you have to take care of each other, right? If you're a peds person and you don't know who about cardiac, you need that cardiac person to help you and you need to help pretty much everybody else who doesn't know and or like little people survive the pediatric stuff. So we're looking for, are you a team player? We're looking for your emotional intelligence. Anesthesia school is hard and heck. There's no two ways about it. And we need to see how you handle being under pressure and under stress for a prolonged period of time. So we're looking for your emotional intelligence and how do you handle difficult situations? I wish I could tell you that every preceptor will always be a perfect personality fit and super kind and give you hugs and do all of those things. But some of them are really direct and they'd be like, Abdu, why'd you do that? They're not meaning it in a bad way, but they are very short. That is their personality. They're very direct. And if that you know, makes you devolve into tears, that's gonna be a challenge for you to recover from while you're trying to intubate a patient. And then the other thing we really look for is your critical care knowledge. We hit the ground running and we, if you don't have a strong critical care background and foundational knowledge, you're going to start behind. So we are going to ask you critical care questions. If you haven't pulled out your CCRN materials in a while, I would strongly recommend you do so. And we want to know that you have breadth and depth. So let's say that you come from a cardiac ICU. So I was a CT SICU person before I went to anesthesia school. I could tell you a lot of stuff about the heart. I hated everything narrow. In fact, I preferred to imagine that there was nothing above the shoulders because I just didn't like it. And if I got floated to the narrow unit, it all but gave me hives. If I were going to interview me, I would ask a bunch of cardiac questions, right? To make sure that I had a really strong depth because that's the kind of ICU that I come from. I would then ask about some narrow questions because I know that's not your specialty, but do you have the critical thinking skills and the strong critical care knowledge to answer those neuro type of questions. 
Do you understand when you're doing something for a patient, why you're doing it? Please don't ever come into an interview and ask, get asked a question about the ventilator and say, oh, I don't know that. Respiratory therapy manages the ventilator. I understand that they manage the, the equipment, right? That metal box, but you're managing the patient. If you don't understand how they're being ventilated in the ventilatory strategies, how are you giving them comprehensive care, right? The respiratory therapist is pushing the buttons, but you should be dialoguing with them and knowing what those different settings are and how it's affecting your patient and their saturation and their atelectasis and, and, and. Does that answer your question? Sorry, yes. it was a little long-winded, but that's what we're looking for in an interview. And how Thank do you, you respond to those in interview is, is gonna be what gets you in. Thank you. Yes. Emily, I'm looking at you to make sure, oh, there's Katie. Do we need to change or can we all just stay put or what do we do? Um, so technically we have a separate Zoom link, um, I believe. So I don't know if there's others that are in that Zoom link that we need to, um, who may, may not be in the session, but might be in the other. Do y'all have that Zoom link? So Emily, can they find up the through Brella. Okay. So we should click over to the other one is what you're telling me. I believe so. Yep. Okay. Just to make sure. <laughs> so we're going to do the financial aid with Katie and then we'll come back and we have a student panel later and I'll be there for that as well. So if you have additional questions, we'll make sure that we cover them. Okay, guys. Awesome. And if y'all have additional questions, feel free to email us at that CRNA questions at emory.edu. Um, again, we're kind of in the midst of applications at the moment. So our reply might be a little bit slower than normal, but um, we will get back to you if you have any questions. All right, we'll see you over in financial aid.